Hey, hope you guys are doing well. Had a great Thanksgiving. I'm um, glad to be back. A little tired right now. I don't know why. Um, I've just been working since five o'clock. Well, anyway, all right. It's about groups at work. This is my fun stuff. I hope you guys learn a lot um, from this lecture and looking through the book and then um, also uh, from the article. Anyway, uh, let's get started. Groups at work. Okay, groups. Um, so start off just disagreeing with the book. Um, the book defines it, and you, you know, it's fine just to do this because it's not particularly set as two or more people engaged in social interactions um, for some goal. And I will be honest that I find my definition is three or more people because I think a dyad is more than likely to be two people. And that's different. How two people interact with each other is different than how three or more pe people interact with each other. I think it is possible to be a group with two people if you're like HR, a representative from HR interacting with a representative from finance. Okay, so you're represent if you're in that role. I think you can be a group then, but if it's like two people of the same work group, they're going to be more of a dyad interacting than the larger group. So it's tricky. You're in grad school, all definitions are tricky, but um, it's two or three or more people engaged in social interactions. Key things about this is they're just sitting there, they're interacting, and they're interrelated. They've got some sort of goal um, that they want. Um, so four people sitting around a table not talking to each other uh, and reading a book is not a group. Oh, this is one of my favorite examples. Unless you know that all four of those people are sitting around the table silently studying for the same test, then it is a group because they are interrelated. They're doing studying for the same test and they probably have interactions. You just don't see them right then. Hmm? Tricky. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's task and social groups at work. We also have formal and informal groups at work. I always love um, my interest really does lie in the overlap of task and social with formal and informal. Like I, I, I really want to know, um, I, I, I'm circling what I really am interested in, the social groups and the informal groups that really get the work done to help the formal organization. So what are we doing here? Okay, roles. Oh, okay. So we've talked about roles a bit before. They become more formalized when we talk about groups. And um, roles are patterns of behaviors that people adopt um, based on what they expect to be doing. Um, my favorite example is I can say, take a group of people who don't know each other and say, okay, person, randomly pick one person, say, all right, you're the leader. All of a sudden they begin to en enact role behavior. And I love the word in act because I think that's really important when you think about roles and groups. They began to perform. They began to do things in their head that um, um, think ways, but perform, enact the role of leader. Um, role expectations. Um, we generally have great ideas of what we're supposed to do um, in a lot of the groups we're in. For instance, um, if this was a face-to-face, -face, we would be talking about, I'm the teacher, you're the student, if there's a TA, what they're doing. We all have ideas of what those roles are. It's, and just to understand how, in, and you never walk into a class. Have you ever walked into a class from kindergarten to now, and you, as the student, just walked up and tried to start teaching the class? Has a teacher, and this, they might be doing this to kind of mess with you, has a teacher come and sat inside the class before the class started. Those are really violating our roles of what our expectations. And if you do it, it really kind of freaks you out. Um, there's also in an organization, we have the roles of the barista, the manager, the cashier and customer. And generally, you know what you're supposed to do and they know what they're supposed to do. And that's how the, organi that's how the group gets the work done in a particular setting. Um, Roles evolve, they differentiate. Um, a freshman does not act as, like a student, the same as a uh, senior or the same as a grad student. I mean, think about roles from like kindergarten through fifth grade to sixth grade. So my kids changing roles to so high school, to college, to graduate school. 
um, to a PhD program, which the role just involves sitting in front of a computer going, oh, I kid a little bit. But yes, roles dif differentiate at your work. The new employee evolves into a, an established employee. <clears throat> and then a, a new manager evolves into an established manager. So roles uh, evolve as people move throughout the organization. Oh, we have group roles. Um, groups uh, need to focus on both task and social processes. This is extremely important. I'm going to say this again, especially from my perceptions of effective teams and groups. Groups cannot just be task focused. They have to be social focused. They have to make sure that um, the bonds between the people are positive and um, because we're going to talk about some where they really break down. So we have task roles and social roles within the group. And this is very important, and especially thinking about your group work or your work at um, organizations. Success for a group means that both the group output is good and the people are willing to work together again in the future. If you don't have both of those, the group was not a success. So think about this. Think about groups you've been in where you've got an A in the, in the project and you just would never work with them again. Oh, I said, hey, you know that joke that says, when I am buried, please let my group members from school, you know, uh, put my casket in the grave so they can let me down, let me down one more time. Ha ha ha. Something like that. Anyway, uh, uh, you have to, group success is you do a good product and you're willing to work together. So just willing to work, to, if you have great social connections, but your task kind of shitty, that's not a good outcome either. They have to have both of those. Um, and as, you know, groups, this is what I always add in, groups have to be concerned about being groupy enough versus just into um, just individuals, and that's intuitivity. Got a whole paper on that. We'll um, do. Oh, we're going to do an example right now. Okay, what's the difference between these two groups? Okay, here is a group of people waiting waiting at a bus stop. They're not really interacting. You know, it's a group of people waiting at the bus stop. It's no big whoop de do. Versus here, it's the same group of people. Can get off. Um, sitting around a lab, mine, um, who are interacting with each other. Uh, talking to each other, they're bounded by the same thing. So this is intuitivity. And so um, the whole point of intuitivity is until people within the group, I mean, if, you know, observers have a level of intuitivity, but I'm really more interested in the intuitivity of the people within the group. Um, if they don't feel enough intuitivity, then uh, you know, they're not going to work on projects together. They're not going to have discussions and make decisions and care about how, how the effects of everything is, you know, care. If, I mean, you, you might care if the bus is late, you're all late to work here, but here you're going to care about you get a good product that gets into publication, do a research thing. Okay. Um, and you'll write about all the stuff in there in the paper, but this is the example I actually use, bus stop. It was a cafe. We didn't do a cafe, we did a lab. All right. So review of role issues. We've been talking about roles a lot because this is where they all come in. It's a pretty important thing. Um, role ambiguity. You know, we saw that in job satisfaction, stress, groups. What am I supposed to do? Uncertainty of how to do this. If you're a leader or a new group member, what do I do here? That's role ambiguity within groups, okay? Causes stress and satisfaction, but um, we still start playing those, okay? Role conflict. Um, I would say, based on what we were talking about, the uh, role conflict of making sure people work and people like each other, okay? Uh, so that can be both within one person or within the group, making sure, like I, I, always, I always laugh in groups. It's supposed to be a bad thing, but I think it helps reduce tension and I think it helps um, uh, reduce tension so that we can get to work. Um, so uh, role followers, uh, followers versus opinion seekers, lots of things you can think of, but usually the social versus versus task roles come in play and um, some of the task conflicts come up with that. And then of course, work friendly conflict and roles, that's our two roles that blah, 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 we've been talking about a lot because it's huge. Work outside, work, you can also think of this as work life conflict. I think that's more inclusive, including that um, you don't have to have a family to actually want to have a life. 
had more of a life, had more of a life when I didn't have a family. I want them to hear that. Anywho, um, norms, norms of the group. Oh, I love norms. Remind me to tell you about yelling at that woman, not yelling, I was actually very polite, asking that woman where her mask was in the campsite. My kids are laughing because that was interesting. Norms, I'm a big proponent that you follow the formal and informal uh, norms of behavior within groups. I mean, I'm big on it. I am a freaking, um, I was a border collie. We follow the norms, we keep the group together. I mean, I am the border collie of researchers. I'm interested in groups. I want them to be together. I want them to follow the rules, okay? Big deal for me. Um, but of course, there are reasons where group members can break the rules, and that's okay too. Uh, if the rules are formal or informal, they're what we do. Um, you know, there's two types, explicit rules versus what we do. Norms of behavior, when we talked about earlier with roles, you're, if we were standing up, I'm standing, you're sitting in a, in a lecture hall, um, you talk, um, uh, oh, yes, just so I put that up there. What I want to do is on Padlet, let's just talk about some of the norms of behavior for Zoom meetings. What have you seen? What are you supposed to do? What are you not supposed to do? When it is, when is it okay? Okay, because there's norms of um, uh, turning off your video. When is it not okay? I think those are kind of interesting things to talk about. Yes, I'm going a little long here. I think these are going to be long because I have lots of things to say. So that's going to be our, our Padlet for norms of behavior. Um, specific to your work meetings, even here, just I think that'd be interesting to see. Now, I'll tell you, this is a gift. When something ever makes you go, oh my gosh, you just had a norm violated <laughs> because they're informal, because many of our norms are informal. We don't know, it's just what you do. And so someone, when someone doesn't do what you do and you go, oh, You've just been given a gift that someone has violated your norm. And you should take that with you from now on that any reaction of oh, is a norm violation. Okay. I can think of tons over the last four years where the entire country's gone. Oh. So anywho, um, so if you're thinking about Zoom meetings, what has, has anybody done anything? You're like, oh my, don't do that. Like turn the light. Going to the bathroom is one of people. I, I haven't had it happen in hours, but anyway. Um, so what you think you're supposed to do and then also when has thing, have things been shocked? Okay, we're going to pause and I'll start the next video up. I have to do that by one minute. Stop. That's ah, so hard. Stop recording. <laughs>